Hmm. But, hmm. Yeah, I forgot to change that. No, there's no midterm next week. Good. No worries. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's one page in there. What is week eleven? We're week eight. Yeah, it's way after. It's after after the spring break for sure. I think there's other work to be done in the meantime. Good afternoon. Uh, there's a lot of stuff um, to talk about today. So uh, first of all, I think uh, we have great the midterm, and I want to pass them back to you. And I uh, would like to briefly walk a little bit to the exam itself and give you some inputs of what we're basically looking for in the different questions. Then I think I would like to just spend some time on the project. Um, we're going to officially launch the project on Friday. We're going to post it on Friday. And that's going to be the start of a um, about seven weeks effort. Actually, add spring break to it, and you have eight. But I just subtracted that. Uh, so it's going to be in different phases, and, and I'll explain to you how this kind of operates. And by the way, we are 2008, uh, not 2007. Uh, okay, good. Um, one more thing um, in terms of laps. Uh, there's going to be no laps for the time being. We have one more lap left to go, which is going to be somewhere around week 12, 11, approximately, which is the hardware lap. But from now on, it really the focus is you learn a lot of stuff in the software lab, so from now on, it's time to start using this and actually start doing some design with it. And that's really what the project is all about. Okay, before going there, let's talk a little bit about the midterm and see where that is leading us. Mm, let me escape this for a second, if I can do that. Cool. We will post the solutions to the midterm on the website, uh, but let me just go briefly to some of the issues that we were addressing. Uh, if you look at question one, um, here's the right answers. That's what you're supposed to basically come up with. 
um, the blue marks. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this. Um, you, I think that's probably a worthwhile effort once we have posted a solution that you go to each of those. I, I can say for sure that those here, the first ones, oops, that doesn't work, uh, were giveaways. And um, those ones are, I think, are straight from the textbook as it stands. So um, having the CMOS inverter figure out what the operation mode is when you have a high and low input, that's something we have, which is, you just can copy from the textbook. So that was an easy one. The PMOS device was a little bit tougher, but actually not hard either. The harder part here was the last two questions, where you have to start thinking a little bit about what's going on. And you see that when the input is low, the NMOS is off, so you have a PMOS and a resistive divider. So it requires you a little bit to think about what is the operation, what's the kind of voltage going to look like, and what is going to be operation mode of the transistors. Um, oops, I'm going too fast. Um, then in terms of the device that we, was picture, that we were picturing on the second page, the second part of that question, that's, um, I think most of you got this right, uh, the, but sometimes the motivation of why it was a PMOS device was kind of strange. But I think if you look at it, it's um, every voltage is negative, and we get more currents when you get more negative voltages. Definitely not going to be an NMOS device. You can know that for sure. So it could be a bipolar transistor, but then you have to prove that you have an exponential relationship between the currents. And, and if you look very carefully at the relationship here, you see that's not the case. So it is a PMOS device, a short channel PMOS device. And once you know that, then really it boils down to, for every one of those most likely, the first two devices where I have basically very small currents, nanoamps, it's really sub-threshold behavior. Um, and then you have some saturation behavior, some um, uh, velocity saturation, some linear behavior. But again, it's, it's a question of very carefully looking at your um, linear of the uh, unified transistor model, filling in the values and see if it matches or not. So this is a question that takes some time and takes some effort to get through the end, but there's no real hidden tricks in here. Uh, there's nothing that kind of is a little bit out of the or, uh, ordinary in this question. Second question is a different ball game. Um, I really, I think I gave you a lot of things in your hand at the review session. I was kind of hammering in the nonlinear part of it. That when you do, what do you do when you have nonlinear component, and how would you deal with it? Um, but still, it seemed like a lot of, people, of you had problems with it. Um, so. It is really a diode, throwing a diode into a traditional inverter. And we create a Zener diode, which has an, uh, basically has an on voltage, which basically goes on when you get 0 0.7 volt, and goes on again if you have minus, uh, zero, uh, minus 3 volt. Okay? Uh, we had to modify it a little bit, uh, because if you think about it, if you just analyze this thing, so you have your NMOS device, if the input here is 0, at the NMOS device. If I put an NMOS, there's no way this NMOS transistor can be on, so it's off. So the question is what's happening then? What's the voltage? Well, initially we had, um, the initial part of the question, we had actually put zero current through the device when it was in the off mode. But then that means that your diode will be off and the output will be floating. So any answer would have been right. A random number. Any pick, pick your number, it would have been right because it's floating, you don't know what the past history is. So that's why we put this very small negative current in. It basically says that if um, your diode is reverse biased, there's going to be some current flowing to it, which is going to pull up this output node all the way up to VDD. That's really why we have this negative current. Now we made one little kind of, um, and some of you figured this out, that actually we also had negative current for positive voltages. And if you look here, you get a small negative current, even when I put the voltage higher than zero volt means that you have kind of negative resistance in there. Right? Positive voltage, negative current. And some of you notice that actually if you would have current flown to the device in this particular mode, you would actually get to go up to 5.7 volts. But we took both answers right. 5.7 volt obviously is a non-realistic thing, like a negative resistance is not realistic. So the, the answer that basically said, okay, I'm see if I can pull this up here. No, it doesn't work. Let me just give you the answers here. I might have it. Okay. So it's 5 volt or 5.7 volt. Both of them are fine. Then uh, you increase, keep on increasing the NMOS device voltage, the VGS. At some point in time, your transistor is going to go on. Actually, the point where it goes on is 1 volt, the threshold of the transistor. Now, this is an idea. Remember, there's no resistor yet. You have a diode and you have a transistor. 
So what's going to happen is your diode turns on in one shot. So your transistor goes on, your current starts flowing, and you turn on the diode. Uh, the diode in that negative direction has a 3 volt voltage drop. So your input voltage goes, or your output voltage goes from 5 volt to 2 volt in one shot, because there's no resistance. Now, if you have infinite gain here, actually the ideal transition point is 1 volt. 1 volt is when the input goes above 1 volt, bingo, it drops. With infinite gain, because there's no resistance anywhere. Okay? And where does it end up? At If your diode is on, or reverse biased in this minus 3 volt direction, it clamps the output voltage at minus, up at 2 volt. 5 minus 3 is 2. So this is kind of the voltage transfer characteristic of this device. 5 volt, NMOS is off, NMOS turns on at 1 volt, brings it down, and the diode turns on at the minus 3 volt point. Okay? And you get 2 volts on the output. Now, this is a really lousy device in the sense that if you look at it, if I compute the noise margins, noise margins, remember, are VOH minus uh, VH and VIL minus VOL, okay? Now, you look at the high noise margin, you get 5 volt minus 1 volt. It's 4 volt, 3.9 volt, doesn't matter. It's, uh, both of them are right. Uh, 4 volt approximately. So that's a good noise margin, as you would expect. You have a high output volt. The noise margin, noise margin low is trickier. Because VIL is what? Is minus, is 2 volt. Um, v, uh, so VOL is 2 volt. VIL is the point where I make this transition here. It's infinite gain, so VIL and VIH are basically the same. VIL is really equal to one, 1 volt. 1 volt minus 2 volt is minus 1 volt. This thing has a negative noise margin. And that's obvious, right? If you look at it, the output here is 2 volts. If I put this to the next gate, and this gate will actually be all, never be off. Uh, because you put two volts in the thing that basically switches at one volt. So it would never be off. Now, obviously, negative noise margins don't make any sense. <laughs> so if the answer noise margin is zero, is just as much right. right. There's no noise margin in this case. Every noise goes right through. Piece of noise. So that's that. So it's a bad gauge, obviously. Yes? Um, how come... VIL is 1 volt, VIH is 1.1, 1 .1, but you have an infinite It's 1 gain. volt. Both of them, if you basically say, you have an infinite transition, right? So you go from very high to very low, 1 volt is fine. You basically you go instantaneously. Yeah, I think it's 1.1 .1 or something if you take into account how much overdrive you need to really pull 20 micro through the diode. But, That's right. you know, yeah. both answers were considered right. Even, yeah. even if you said 1 volt or 1.1, 1 .1, that doesn't really make a big That's difference. Right. Yeah, you could basically solve the whole thing in detail, and you come up, there's, a, there's some voltage drop. Uh, there. If you solve it exactly, it's more than one volt, but it's like, you know, a relevant uh, quantity more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that part. So um, now when you add the resistance to it, so the question is, uh, calculate the resistance so that VOL is equal to 250 millivolt. What you really have to do here now is, is, is that the equation gets a little bit more complex. So I know that VOL is 250 millivolt, so I know the output voltage. That's cool. Um, I know um, the, um, the current through the device. I know the NMOS device. So you, pay, you have the VDS is given, the VGS is given. So I can compute the current. So you have a resistor, a diode, and a transistor. I know the current to the, di uh, to the resistor. We know there's going to be 3 volt drop over the diode. So uh, I left over to that is zero, uh, 3 volt plus 250 millivolt. That's, uh, that's 3.25, means that the voltage drop over the resistor is going to be 1.75 volts. I know 1.75 volt, I know the current, I can find out the resistance. Okay? And that's up around 400 uh, ohm or something like that, something in that realm. Okay? So that's the way you solve this. You write down the equation, the DC equation, VDD minus the voltage drop over the resistor minus the diode drop is equal to 250 millivolts and then you plug in the values. So that boils down. And actually, the next question is exactly the same thing. It's the same equation. But now I'm able to say, OK, find the dependence, and you plug in there. When is going to VOL going to be 0? You plug it in that equation, and you find the number. OK, so actually, these two parts are actually virtually identical. And then finally is the power consumption. You have given the capacitance. You know the transition ratios, and so on and so forth. We know the current levels. So the power is VDD. This is static power we're looking at here. So VDD times I, we know the current level, we solve them, so you know the current 
in the on mode, and obviously the current in the off mode is zero, 50% of the time. So you take VDD times IDD times basically one half. Okay? All right. Now, next question uh, is um, a number of you got confused here uh, in the sense that they always try to apply the current equations of the transistor. ID is VGS minus, uh, well, device is saturation, linear, write down the equation, thing like that. These equations were totally uh, irrelevant because, number one, I didn't give you a single transistor parameter, so you didn't know what VT was, you didn't know what lambda was, you didn't know what VGS was, VDSAT. But you have basically defined completely the current voltage relationship as this plot here. Okay? So part one is um, determine TPHL. Okay? Two very different ways of solving this problem. You could have done both ways, and both of them are equally valid. I can use the average current or the average resistance approach. Both of them are just perfectly fine. Uh, the question is average between what? Okay, obviously, when I put the input from 0 to VDD, VGS does what becomes what? Becomes equal to VDD. So the curve of interest is really this curve here. The top curve is the one that's of interest. The other one doesn't matter. Because VG, we never have VDS, VGS is equal to half, one half VDD. When you basically put a step at the input, we go right away VGS is VDD, and we're going to traverse over this curve. And we start here, obviously, when the output is equal to VDD, and we go to the midpoint. That's really what you're into this in when you evaluate propagation delay. Okay? So you start here and you go to the midpoint. So initially, if I look at the numbers, initially I get 100 microamp. So the question is, how much do I get in the midpoint? Well, that was a little bit trickier because now we have to interpolate between the two points here. So we know the value of the current at 0 0.2 volt. We know the value of the current at 1 volt. So was the value of the current at 0 0.5 volt, right here in the midpoint. Boils down to be about, um, I believe it's around um, uh, 87 or something like that microamp. You had 87, you got 100, you divide by 2, the average current is 93 microamp. I have the average current, I know the capacitance, and I know it's VDD over 2, and you plug it into that equation. That's approach number one. Okay. Approach number two says, well, I'm going to take the equivalent resistance, same thing. I have the current here, I know the voltage, so that's resistor 1. I know the current here, I know the voltage, that's resistor 2. You take the average of the two, I have my resistance. 0 0.69 times that resistance times CL gives you the answer. Okay? Now, part B was a giveaway, again. It basically says, uh, if you look at it, everything is fully symmetrical in this thing. The PMOS has exactly the same driving strength on the NMOS. So what do you expect the answer to be? exactly the same as in the previous question. So the pull-up and the pull-down speeds are exactly the same. Okay? Now, next thing is I'm going to show, oh, I'm asking you what is the current look like? What's the value of I out versus V out? Well, if you think about it, it's nothing else than the current expression we have plotted out there. So you can just repeat the chart which was up there on the first page, repeat it over here, plot it out, and bingo, you got it. So there was nothing uh, spectacular in there, and, and a, number of, most, a number of you got this right, actually, got the, did this very well. But it's just a uh, repetition of this discharge curve that I've showed you. Okay, now, what we do now is replace the PMOS by an NMOS device. Same deal, what I have to do for finding VOL, I know uh, VDD minus RL, so you know that uh, ID is equal to VDD minus uh, VOL divided by RL. Okay, that's one equation. And I have to equalize this to the current to my device. Okay, that's basically what I have to find. Again, obviously, you have to go back to the curves we have. We have to find an expression of the current as a function of the output voltage here. Now, you have to figure out where you are. What's going to happen? What's the value of VD? Uh, where are we going to be on the curve? Are we going to be on this part, the linear part? Or are we going to be in saturation? Once I, I don't know. Actually, it could be both ways, right? Because I don't know exactly where VOL is going to be sitting. Okay, it could be above 0 0.2. It could be below 0 0.2. Both don't actually that it didn't matter. Because the answer was 0 0.2 volt. 
So whatever you picked, you would have had the right result. And then what I do is say, well, I know the current here. I can find the current of this in this region here is easily expressed as a function of the voltage because I know the curve. And the same thing here. It's a pure linear equation. So on one side, I have the current to the resistance. On the part, I have the current to the, to the transistor. I equalize it to, I, have, I solve for VOL, and I have a VOL of that. And I said the answer was exactly 0 0.2 volt. So whatever assumption you took, you were right. Uh, made it life a little bit easier. OK. And then this part here is what is VO, I out versus V out, again, for the high to low transition. High to low transition, so that's when the NMOS is on. If you really solve this and you work it out, it's nothing else than you basically, it's the current to the resistor. And it comes up, up to 0 0.2, there's nothing, and then you really have your resistance current. And finally, the high to low propagation delay. Again, two solutions, one of them with currents, one of them with resistances. Some of them did it perfectly right. I said, well, now I have my resistance of, the, of part one of the question. If I now put 10 kilo ohm in parallel with that, I get my resistance of the new circuit here. And then 0 0.69 times that equivalent resistance times CL gives me the answer. If you do the current, uh, you initially get 100 microamps as before. But in the midpoint, we have to make sure that you take into account the fact that there's some current flowing to the resistance, right? uh, which is the difference. But again, that was solvable. You take the average, and you get approximately the same result. OK? So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what it was all about. So it sounds easy when you look at it from a distance, but obviously it was a fairly lengthy exam. There were a lot of things to be done. Um, and that's where some of you obviously struggled with in terms of the overall finishing of it, because getting enough time to go to the whole problem set. So where does that lead us? Let me just change this. So this is what it came out. Um, the total was on 52. Um, there was one person who got up to 48. That's pretty close. Um, the mean is just around 25.3, which is just halfway. Actually, if you look at the distribution, by the way, multiply these numbers here. Like 1, you multiply this with 5. So this is between 5 and 10. This is between 10 and 15 between 15 and 20, and so on and so forth. This is between 45 and 50. So you see the majority of you are sitting smack here between 25, 15 and 30. That's where the large section of the class is. And then we have kind of a, a tail at the front uh, with about eight, nine students, which are above 35. And then there's some little tail here in the back as well. And, and if you're obviously in this tail, uh, I think it's probably worthwhile uh, to come and chat with me Say, hey, uh, what went wrong? Uh, what can I do to kind of pick up on those things? But overall, this is quite typical for a first midterm. You will see the second midterm, you will see a different distribution. Um, uh, this is the way I've seen it over the years, at least the, the type of exams I give. First midterm, people struggle a little bit, with it, and then they figure it out how to do, and, and things get better. So standard deviation is actually quite large. Uh, for if you think about it, the three sigma is way out of the range of what you would expect. So, so it's be, the, that's because of, of those outliers and this very wide spread that we really have. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions? So we'll post the solutions um, on the website. You'll probably find them later today or tomorrow, and I'll hand out the exams at the end of the class. Okay. Any questions? Uh, if you have any questions about, oh, by the way, if you find any problems with the grading. You get exactly one week time to come back to me. So by next Wednesday, I would like to see you during my office or whatever it is. After that, it's closed door, right? Um, I think you have to put a limit on those. And um, so by next Wednesday, if you see um, anything which is sometimes we add up wrong, actually it turns out I learned over the years that we only add up wrong in one direction. I've never seen, well, actually my whole career, I've seen one time one person said, well, you added up wrong and I gave me too many points. Uh, it was one time. Well, the other time was no. You, you added up wrong, and it was uh, you gave me too, not enough points. So it's happened. Okay, good. Um, having said that, so let's talk about the project. So what I, men I mentioned before is what I would like to do this semester is play around with arithmetic, uh, not with 
memories or not with large sequential network, but what I would like to do is build uh, high performance logic. Okay? And the way we're going to do this is design actually an FIR filter. Now, who of you has never seen an FIR? Oh, who of you has ever seen an FIR filter? Who has never seen an FIR filter? Uh, this is, uh, I think, EEC, EECS 120 probably covers it to a certain extent. Um, maybe 20. Does 20 cover filters? So, so you must have seen it somewhere. Um, what an FIR filter is, 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 it says it's a filter. It's a frequency selective component. I get a stream of inputs coming in at sample discrete inputs. And I feed it to this filter, and you do some frequency selectivity. Could be a low pass, could be a high pass, could be a band pass, or a band stop filter. OK? So what you do, I try to do is shape things. And obviously, filters are very important. They're used in audio components. They're used in communications. They're used in, uh, in uh, video processing. Filtering plays in unwanted components. Or and uh, unwanted signals into your system. Now, there's a couple of ways of implementing filters, but the first one, and the one we are going to pick here, is called finite impulse response filter. And it's all in there. It says that if you take a filter, that typically the response of a filter will be determined by what they call the impulse response. The, the impulse response is I take a filter structure and I apply a s impulse, a direct impulse at the input. Okay. And then out of this, you will get some outputs coming. And that output will have some memory. These filters typically have some memory, so it will take a little bit. But with the finite impulse response filter, it's exactly said the impulse response has a finite length, exactly a fixed number of um, discrete times where you're going to get an output. So you have a third order filter, and they apply an impulse at time zero, and let's say the number of the of the, 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 the order of the filter is three, after three clock cycles, the output is going to go back to zero. The memory is gone, it's finite. Okay? Now, what a, uh, the way you do this, actually, if you want to write the general equation of an FIR filter, it, it, a discrete FIR filter is something like this yn is equal to the sum from zero to n minus one times ai times x n minus i. And this is i equals 0 to 2. So, so it's, it's uh, a finite sum of multiplications. OK? So I just show a simple example of this, of how you could implement this thing. So let's say I, say I take input stream x. These are consequent samples coming in. So you have a sample at time 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Now, one of the core elements of this thing is a delay line. The delay line is, you can look at the delay in the discrete time, it just de delays a certain signal by one time period, OK? Which typically will be your clock, OK? So if I have this delay line, at the input I get xn. At the uh, first step of that delay line, I'm going to get the same input, but one clock cycle ago, two clock cycles ago, three clock cycles ago, and so on and so forth, OK? To infinity. No, well, not to infinity. It's a finite response, OK? So that implements this xn minus i part. So then I take each of those elements and multiply it with a coefficient, a fixed number, a i. So this is a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3. And then I add them together. I, as this equation said, this is the sum part, this is the multiplication part, and xn minus i is the delay line part. So you see the equation. What we do is take that equation and implement it directly into logic. OK? So very straightforward so far. It's really kind of a, it, it's a, uh, now obviously this could be a sum of, uh, this is a, uh, a, a adder with a fan n of n which you will never implement that way, obviously. I don't have an adder which has 100 inputs. You try to do this with adders, we have two inputs, and then you take the output and feed in the next adder, into the next adder, into the next adder. 
right? But we'll come back to that later today when we talk about adders, okay? But it's uh, conceptually, that's a diagram of what we're trying to do. Now, this will be a lot of work as a project because there's one thing in here which is really a pain to implement, that's multipliers. Multipliers, let's say, I take 16 by 16 bit multiplier, these are biggie hardware components. Uh, take a lot of, a lot of adder cells, a lot of components. Um, so, if I would basically do this for a project, you end up with designing huge number of gates and a fairly complex layout and so on and so forth. So, we're gonna make life a little bit easier for you. We're gonna say, gee, rather than having a, um, actually, if you look at this very carefully, this actually is only a multiplication, it's an multiplication of a variable with very often a fixed number, right? AI, if I know the coefficients in advance, what I have is a multiplication by a fixed number, not two variable or two variable numbers getting multiplied, but a, a variable times a fixed number that I know in advance. And if I know something in advance, I can exploit that. that. <laughs> Simplify the multiplier. Actually, what I'm going to do is get rid of those multipliers altogether. I'm not going to use multipliers. It's too much work and too much hardware. And I only can do that when I know the coefficients in advance. If I would like to have a programmable filter, I would have to be able to program the coefficients in there and change them over time. And then obviously I need a multiplier. Okay? But for this fixed filter that we're trying to build, and we're going to give you very well-defined values for the coefficients, then we can do something simpler. Let me give you an example. Um, and this is the example I have in the text, but let me start with a very simple one. If I would like to multiply xn times 0 0.5, suppose my coefficient by accident is 0 0.5. Now, 0 0.5 is a power of 2, right? 2 minus 1. I can imp implement a multiplying something by a half is actually a very simple operation. It's a shift to the right. I just shift it down one position and I have to have the value. So multiplying something with a power of two is equivalent to a shift operation. Uh, so that we're gonna use that to our advantage because say, well, gee, I, this is trivial. I just take the input and I move it one position, bingo and we have half the value. Now I say, well, you're lucky, right? Uh, you have 0 0.5. What would happen if I have another number? Like um, I show in the next example here, suppose I have 0 0.375. Well, again, I'm actually quite lucky here because 0 0.375 is equal to 0 0.25 plus 0 0.125. Or if you put it in binary notation, this is going to be 0 0.011, okay? So if I write something in binary, you can see that there's zeros in here. And zeros means no work. And once is multiplying with a power of 2. In this case, 2 minus 2 and 2 minus 3 is 1, 8. So the way I could implement this whole thing is I take x n minus i, for instance. I shift it over two positions, two positions to the right, bingo. And I, that's my first thing. That's basically multiplying by 0 0.25. I take that output and shift it again over one position, add it to it, and I basically add, have now here one quarter, and I have one eighth, and the whole result is x n i minus 0 0.375. So what you see is that your coefficient is now written in this binary format, say something like this, if this would be my coefficient, what I do is for every one of those ones, I have a shift operation. I'm gonna add them together, okay? So I replace the multiplication by shifts and adds. Now adders we already need, we already needed some adders at the bottom. So adders are gonna be very important. Now you say, well, how do you, in the world do you implement a shifter? Well, actually, if the coefficient is fixed and I know by how much I shift, you don't have to do anything. You just take the numbers in and you shift them by wiring to the next adder. You just move everything one position over and you have shifted over one position. 
you wire it by two positions, you have divided by four. So you don't have to design any hardware for that. It just wires, which is kind of cool. So it turns out for this FIR filter, what we're going to need is what? Registers and adders. That's all I need. And then you have to put them all together in this very complex entity that ultimately gets you your filter. So the filter has five coefficients. Uh, it's a fifth order filter. But it's uh, like most FIR filters, it's phase linear. The, uh, it's only the odd coefficients that are going to matter, or the even ones, depends so how you start and things like that. So actually, of the five coefficients, there's going to be two that are totally zero. And three of other ones are going to have a value. So there's actually three multiplications I have to perform. And the resulting filter is, I believe, a band stop filter, right? Or is it band pass, band stop, right? Band stop filter. So that's kind of what we're going to go after. That's what we're going to design. Uh, basically, adders and registers, and then put them together. And we're going to make it, we're trying to try to ultimately make this thing either fast or very low power. OK? So we're going to make life easy for you. Uh, we're going to first start saying, OK, let's learn how to put such things together and figure out where the critical elements are. So we're going to give you an adder cell pre-designed and a register cell pre-designed. You're going to get a layout and a transistor schematic for the adder cell and for the register cell. So you don't have to worry about that. You take, the, take them as given. But your job is going to put it all together in such a way that the thing does the right stuff, number one. And then, obviously, this is not going to be a simple network. There's going to be quite a bit of additions here. Adders in a row, wired together. Next thing you're going to have to do in phase one is to figure out how fast it is by figuring out what is the critical timing path through this logic. What's going to set my clock frequency? Um, it's a chain of adders, obviously. So you define the critical timing path, and then using Spectre, we're going to check, well, uh, well, actually, one step further, we're first going to basically do analysis of the adder and the register cell. That's easy. Right? You take SPICE or Spectre. You simulate it, and you figure out what the delays are between every input and every output. And I build a little model. I actually build a logical effort type of model that we described before. For every cell, we kind of create a delay model. And then you look at your schematic, and you say, here's my critical timing path. Now, using logical effort, I should be able to predict the delay. And that's what I would like to see. It's basically saying, gee, given this thing here, that's the way the delay of this thing is going to look like. And then I want you to prove it to me using Spectre. I said, hey, I simulated out, I provide the right input vectors, and I'm going to get this result. And it's a little bit different than what I predicted, but that's why. I can explain why there's some difference between I see in Spectre and what I predicted. That's really phase one of the project, is putting it together and starting to understand what's going to dominate your performance. Then in phase two, so you get actually three weeks' time for that. So we start on Friday, and I think by uh, April something, uh, which is exactly two weeks, almost exactly two weeks after, we have a little report from each of you, or actually from every group, uh, detailing what you've done and what your results are. Then we're going to go into phase two and say, now I'll let you go after some optimization goal. Uh, this, obviously, the first implementation is not going to be a good implementation. I know that uh, because I haven't given you any room yet. You take the adder, you put them together, bing, 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 you're done. I didn't ask you to optimize anything. Now you start looking at your structure and say, maybe I can do certain things in terms of sizing. Maybe I can restructure, move the cells around, change the cells in such a way that I get a better response, or a faster response or a lower power response. That's phase two, and we're going to do this at a high level. No spy simulations at this level. I want you to think about the problem and build a high-level model and maybe throw it in MATLAB or whatever you do, but try to find a means for you to move to something which is better. And then that's going to give you, give you two weeks for that. And then there's the final three weeks is now do it. Uh, implement the layouts, put it all together, Simulate it and show that it works and that it's darn good. Right? <laughs> Convince me that this is the best possible design you could get given the constraints that we have put on you.
Okay. So you see a first learning phase, then optimization phase, then implementation phase, and verification phase. Obviously, it should work, hopefully. Um, a non-functional uh, design is not that good in general. So that's the whole idea. Uh, now, what's going to be the outcome of this whole thing is that we're going to have uh, phase one, small report. I like small reports. Uh, long reports are bad. Uh, so I'm going to give you a fixed template, probably three to four pages you can fill in, put some plots. And in these three pages, you have to show what you've done and what your results are, which you can perfectly do. Um, be concise is always the most important thing. If you want to prove something, you give somebody a document of 60 pages, you're never going to convince a person. Even one paragraph says, that's why this thing is doing the right thing. It's a lot better. So that's uh, phase one and phase two. Phase three, we go one step further. Uh, obviously, that's the final thing. That's where you really get the opportunity to convince me that's really good. We'll ask you to make a poster. A uh, poster which basically summarizes your results. And we're going to have a poster session where we walk around. Everybody has a poster up. And we basically have a little kind of five to 10 minute type of discussion about your project uh, with the TAs, with us, and so on and so forth. So it's going to be give you the opportunity in an oral way not written, which is sometimes it's kind of hard to explain what you're doing in a written format. It's not nicer to have a couple of pictures to say, here's that, what my design is, I changed that, and bingo, that's what I get. Right? So that's kind of the flow of the project. So we have seven weeks to go, and I can tell you you're going to learn a lot. This is where you're going to basically, everything you hear in class here, that's going to translate it into something which is tangible, something where you say, hey, I've done a design, and I start understanding what basically drives designers. What makes it basically work? Okay. By the way, the other thing that I want to mention is the project is performed in groups of two. Okay. Uh, try try to find your partner. Doesn't have to be exactly the same partner you use for the lab. If it's, that's the way you want it, that's okay with me. If you want to take another part? Fine as well. Now I know there's always going to be people that come up and say I cannot find a partner. That's number one. Uh, or I would like to have a group of three. Um, in principle, that's not what, um, I discourage this. Uh, I prefer, I really think you should try to find groups of three, uh, groups of two. If you want to uh, deviate from that thing, you have to get permission and you have to have a good reason for it. Okay? Because obviously when I have a group of three, I expect work for three. Right? And it's, it's not, that would be nice. I make a group of ten and say, okay, we're done. Right? Now, it, it, uh, I expect more. If somebody works on his own or her own, um, obviously I, I don't expect the same amount of depth in general. That's why I think I, it's kind of harder to compare at that point in time. So that's why I prefer groups of two. And as I said, when somebody fear, really feels you need a group of three, I'm going to ask for extras. OK? Any question? Yes? How much is the, is there a prize money for this project? <laughs> I think last, um, actually, I have to check on that. Uh, we had uh, one year, I think, we have an AMD basically giving a uh, prize. I'll, I'll check with AMD again, actually. I haven't heard from them yet. But we'll see if I can do something there. Uh, yeah, they gave some prize money, and they actually uh, had the winners, the best design, actually got a tour of the AMD fabs. Uh, so I'll see if I can set something up like that up. Because that, but otherwise, yeah. Um, well, the good prize is going to obviously be, the biggest prize is going to be the great you're going to get. Uh, that helps. Um, it's not financial, but we'll see what I can do. Okay? Any other questions? So for those of you who are not familiar with filters, I don't think, don't worry too much about it. Now, here's one question. Who has never seen, never seen an adder cell before, an adder, full adder before? Anybody has never heard about full adders? Never seen full adders? CS61C uh, is the first place where you would run into those things. Uh, 150, CS150 obviously does a lot of those type of things. But even then, um, the rest of this lecture is actually going to be devoted to adders. Well, actually, not really true. I still have to finish up logical effort. But I'm going to do adders in the next sequence. After that, we're going to go back and talk about some other logic levels. And I'm gonna also then I'm going to talk about registers as well so that you're kind of familiar with the things we're trying to put in there. OK? No more questions? Good. All right, so that's where we are. I think, um, and again, be, be, don't be afraid. Definitely 
not in phase one, but in phase two and three, be creative. This is the fun part, right? If I, the reason I like to be an electrical engineer is that you have a problem, you have a challenge ahead of you, you try to explore new solutions. That's where the real fun of engineering is. Not repeating what somebody else already has done is extremely boring. Right? But basically brain creating something new, trying to find this, a way of changing something around in such a way that I get a better answer, that's cool. So I bet definitely, if you look at the part of the grading process, is going to be I give always extra points for creative solutions. Even sometimes they fail. It happens occasionally. But if you don't take risk in life, you're never going to get anywhere. So occasionally taking a risk and then say, oh, darn, that really didn't pan out that well, but at least it was fun, is still a good approach. OK, having said that, um, let's get back a little bit to logical effort. I still have a little bit of things to do. So now you can start seeing why logical effort is important. Uh, you're going to start building these complex networks with a lot of gates. And I'm going to ask you to use logical effort, for instance, to analyze critical path delays and so on and so forth. So it's an important part of the whole story. So the whole idea of logical effort is that I take an inverter as my token element. I say, OK, the delay of an inverter is, K is Tp is equal going to be 2 to so tau invert times 1 plus or gamma plus the electrical fan out. Right? That's my delay of an inverter. And what I'm going to do now with every other gate, be it a NAND gate, being a NOR gate, and so on and so forth, I'm going to try to refer it to an inverter. Compare it how it behaves in terms of performance compared to that inverter. And we see there's two main key differences. As number one, if you have a more complex gate, this first factor here, this intrinsic delay, is going to increase with a factor p. So the parasitic, this is what we call the parasitic or intrinsic delay, goes up with a factor p. So you go from an inverter to a 2 input NAND, we see that this parasitic delay goes up approximately with a factor of 2. And then there's the other part which says that a uh, more complex gate has a harder time driving a capacitor than, an uh, than what an inverter would take. And that's mostly the slope here. If you now put fan out here, electrical fan out, you see that the slope will increase if I go to more complex gates. Okay? So where the logical effort of an inverter is 1, or we have now for a more complex grid, we will basically get this concept of logical effort. Is how hard do I have, does a gate have it to drive a capacitor? So an inverter is the ideal case, it's one. If you take more complex gates, you have a factor here which is going to be larger than one. It's again, that's the slope compared to the inverter. If you would divide the slope, what you get is the logical effort. So the bottom line is that the delay of a gate, if you can refer it to an inverter, and I basically get rid of this tau invert because that's a constant that I can divide out. It's just a, a multiplier. It says that delay Tp is going to be equal to P plus Le times F. Okay? Where F is the electrical fan out, Le is the logical effort, and P is the parasitic delay. And the multiplication of those two we call the effective fan out, EF. It's a multiplication of logical effort times F. It creates a, uh, the fan out becomes, is multiplied by a certain factor because I have a harder time driving it. Okay? Now, if I do this, that's for a single gate. Come on. Oh, it's animating some stuff. Good. If you now do this for a complex multistage network, remember the additive property, if I put gates in a row, I just have to take the sum of those different components. So the delay is going to be the sum over the path of this P plus Le times Fi. And now for a given path between input and an output, we can define the path delay, we can define the, uh, the, the um, path logical effort, and so on. The path electrical fan out Let's say I have a bunch of gates in sequence. Let's say here. The overall F fan out, electrical fan out of this chain here is the ratio of the input capacitance over the output capacitor, like we did before. 
for inverters, same deal. You have the pot here. You look at the load capacitance. You look at the input capacitance. The ratio between those two is the path electrical fan out. The path logical effort is the multiplication of all those gates by each other. Each of them has logical effort. We multiply those. The overall effective fan out of the effective fan out of the I already defined that's EFI, so that's not nothing new. There's one more thing we'll basically I'll come back to that in a second is the branching effort. This assumes that you have a chain. You can imagine that if I now have fan out here going to other branches in this network, I have to accommodate for that extra load somewhere. That's what's going to be done by the branching effort. And the total branching effort of a path is a multiplication of the branching effort of every stage. Okay? But the bottom line is that I can describe the delay as a sum of the parasitic delays times the sum of the effective fan outs of different stages. And I finally find also the path effort is a product of the logical efforts times the product of the branching times the electrical fan out. Okay? So now that I have this, I can do exactly the same thing as I did before for inverter stages and say, what would be now the optimal sizing of my gates? Okay? Remember what we came up with inverters is every stage in your buffer has to do the same amount of work. Or equally, every stage is equally responsible for the total delay. Or actually it's going to produce the same propagation delay uh, over every stage. So we, what we know now is that every stage will have the same delay. Now what does that mean? If every stage has the same delay, it means that the electrical effective fan out of every stage should be the same. If you look at this propagation delay expression, the propagation delay is PI plus the effective F. So you want to basically separate out the, the, the propagation delay, you want to sip, make it equal. What you do is the effective fan out of every stage should be exactly the same. Not the electrical fan out, the effective fan out of every stage. So something that has a higher a logical effort will have, can only drive a smaller fan out. Right? Because remember, the effective fan out is the same from stage to stage to stage. An inverter is a powerful thing. It can drive a lot of fan, electrical fan out. However, if logical effort is larger than one, you can see that Fi of that stage has to be smaller. So uh, complex gates can only have a small load, while small gates can have a larger load. But it all balances out, and every stage provides exactly the same propagation delay. Okay? That's the way you have to look at it from a, a high perspective. So that's just repetition, logical effort, or the effective efforts of every stage is the same, and out of this we can find the delay. And then we can do the same thing as we did with inverters, say, okay, What's the number of stages? If I can change the network, what would be the design? How would I choose my design in such a way that I minimize the overall delay? And you solve the thing, and once again, we're going to come out with a factor of four. Same equation, same nothing thing. The effective fan out of every stage should be approximately equal to four. No new thing here is exactly the same answer as before. So try to keep your effective fan out to four is the idea. OK? Good, so that's where we were at the end of last class. And I think it was worthwhile to repeat this for a little bit. So let's now talk a little bit about the branching effort. Because I haven't talked about that at all yet. So let's start with just pure inverters. Okay? Um, you have a main path here, but suppose I have a buffer and I put some extra inverters on the side here. Okay? I could have some here and so on and so forth. Now you can see that uh, this inverter has not only to drive this fan out part, but also has to drive the other capacitor or the other inverters that are hanging off that path. But that extra load doesn't help really anything for the path. I'm really optimized, let's say, in the propagation delay between here and here. This thing is kind of a hindrance. And all those things having off the side basically acts provide extra load. It's going to make it harder for me to minimize this. And the way you capture this is by that's what we call the branching effort for every state, is I say, okay, I look at this node, and I take the, I look at the load, total load capacitance, okay, of all the fan-out gates, and I divide it by the capacitance that's really on the path of interest, that's the C on path, and that's what we call the branching effort. So if I would have this, 
then obviously B is equal to 1. And the branch, there's no branching. Well, if I do this, and they're all the same gates, here the branching effort is going to be, total capacity is 4, the one that's on the pot is 1, the branching effort is 4. Okay? So that's just a metric of relative loads on the different stages. So let me just explain you a little bit. So remember, the total path effort we defined is going to be defined as the products of the logical efforts times the electrical fanout of the pot times the branching effort. It takes into account all the work that pot has to do to get physical things done. So for instance, let's take this simple example. I have one inverter of size 5 driving a fan out of 2, size 15, with a load capacitance equal to 90. Okay? Now, uh, what do we know? The electrical fan out of this thing is going to be what? 90 divided by 5. Right? So this is the input capacitance here is 5. Output capacity is 90. So the electrical fan out, path fan out of this thing is 90 divided by 5. That's really what we're trying to drive. What's the logical effort? of the path here. Let's say I'm interested in part one here. What's the logical effort of this path? One, right? Two times an inverter. Inverter is always one. One times one is one. So that's cool. Uh, the final we defined already is 90 divided by 5. So the path effort is going to be equal. So, um, so that's what, uh, that's this. 90 divided by 5 is 18. So uh, one thing could be saying, well, the path effort is just going to be the product of the logical effort times the fan out. Right? That would be the, if you would only have a single path, that would be perfectly correct. Right? You take the logical effort over the path, you multiply the fan out of the path, and you say, okay, the product of the two is 80. That's not correct, because it doesn't take into account the branching part. Because this guy here in the middle doesn't drive only this 15, but also actually does a double effect here. Actually, if we want to keep the stage efforts the same, actually we see that the stage effort of stage um, one here is it drives 15 plus 15 over 5, right? And the logical effort is 1. So the stage effort of this stage is 6, while the stage effort of uh, stage 2, 6 as well as 90 divided by 15 is 6. So the path effort actually effectively is 36. The path effort, remember, is the product of the stage efforts. So you see that this is wrong. Something is missing here. Stage effort, we know exactly 15 plus 15 divided by 5 is 6. 90 divided by 15 is 6. So the product of the two says, hey, the path effort is 36. And that's the correct value. Because what's wrong here? We didn't take the branching into account. If I would say, here's the branching effort of this thing is 2, which it is, right? Is 30 is the total capacitance divided by the capacitance per node. 30 divided by 15, branching effort is equal to 2. And the total pad branching is basically 2 times 1 is equal to 2. So my, uh, my path effort is going to be 1 times 18 times 2. And then you get 36. And it's two stages. I divide it equally. Each stage, I get 6. Perfect design, we're in good shape. This is sized correctly. Okay? So that shows you a little bit of an idea of why branching effort is important. Now, what I'm going to do now is apply this thing and try to do a little design here and see where we get. So here's a design where we have um, three gates and um, um, three sequences of gates. The first gate isn't given in size like always, and we also know the load capacitance, okay? So the first gate has an input capacitance which is equal to C, some number C. The load is 9C, okay? Uh, you can see that all paths are exactly the same, but let's take this particular path here and analyze it. Okay, so what is the um, uh, electrical fan out of this thing? Electrical fan out of this path is what? Electric fan out is output capacitance divided by input capacitance. So that's what? That's easy, right? Nine. All right. So I'm going to put nine here. What's going to be the logical effort of the path? These are two input NAND gates. 
Remember what the logical effort of a two input NAND gate is? Any clue? Four third? Is it four third? Uh, let me just think. Yes, it is correct. Uh, yes, it's, it's Bob, where you have it right here. Thank you. So it's four third to, but that's not sufficient for the path effort is what? It's four third to the power three. Because you have three times in a row, four third, four third, four third. Okay? Branching effort is what? Well, exactly the branching effort here, you have a fan out of two, so this branches out one, that's going to be a factor two. Here, there's basically three gates connected, that's going to be three. So the total branching effort should be six. So the total path effort that we'll see between input and output here is going to be six times nine times four third over the power three. Okay, and again, I, these numbers will be confirmed. Well, you had them right in front of your face. Um, make life easier. Here you go. It's, uh, that's what we basically should be able to get here. Because, yeah, that's 4 to the third times 6. 4 to the third is uh, 64 times 6. Uh, that should be, that's not, that's 4 to the third is 16, 64. Hmm. So kind of trying, how do you get to 128? Somewhere something is wrong. Because um, that's, oh, no, no, it's factor 3 divided by, yeah, 128 is right, about right. So, you get now this, you know the total stage path effort. Remember, for an optimal design, what you need is every stage effort should be the same. So the stage effort will be the third root out of this PE, right? And again, you can solve for that, and we're going to get a number, and that's exactly what I... I just wrote here. It's the third order out of PE, and I think there's a number that goes with it. And it's equal to 5 approximately. If you take 128, third order root, 5 times 5 times 5 is about 125. So 5 is got a decent number. So it says stage effort is still is 5 uh, for every stage. Now that's good because now we can already tell you what the delay of this thing is going to be, the optimal delay. You get 3 times 2. That's the parasitic delay, right? Every stage is an AND gate. Parasitic delay is two, so it's three times two in a row. And then you have a stage effort of five. Again, everyone has the same, so three plus five. So the delay is going to be 21 times the delay of an inverter, okay? So I know that's the best you can do. Um, now, I still have to define the sizes, and the way you're typically going to go is I know the stage effort, I know the fan out. Other than that, I can find the size of trans of Z, stage Z. Once I know that, I can basically go back and find the size of stage Y. And you're done. Okay? So, but it shows how branch effort comes into the whole game. And again, this is going to be important in the project because, remember, your logical network is not going to be a very nice type of single chain of inverters. You're going to have a lot of adder cells and so on and so forth. Okay? All right. So, bottom line, this is the summary. The way we do logical effort, you compute the path effort by taking a look at the branching effort, electrical fan out, and logic, product of logical effort of every stage. You find the optimal number of stages if you have that freedom. If the logic is not fixed, if you still can mess around, you say, well, the optimal number of stages is going to be log 4 of PE. Remember the 4 factor, the magic number 4. And then I can compute the effective fan out per stage. There's PE over the root of 1N. You sketch your path, and then you work from the end out, and you basically go brrr towards the front and find all the size of your transistors. Okay? And if you're really very excited about logical effort, you really think this is the coolest thing in the earth, there's actually a complete book about it that talks about nothing else. It solves it for a whole variety of networks and so on and so forth. It's written by uh, Ivan Sutherland, uh, Sprawl and Harris. It's, it's a book that came out in 1999. So for those of you who are really into this, um, but I think what we have in our textbook it should be more than enough for 141. Okay? All right, that's logical effort. Uh, I really want to make sure that we worked that out quite well because it's very important. It's, it's going to play an important role. It also will help us to understand the advantages of different logic families. Very often I can see two logical families, or two topologies, like, like with adders. I'll show you some adders. So adder 1, adder 2. Same function, and I'm going to ask you which one is better. 
uh, can you tell me which one is better? I did before. And very often, just try to compute the logical effort of the two structures and say, hey, this one is, is going to outperform this one. I can know that. Okay? All right. Having said that, let's talk a little bit about adders um, and data paths. So, why do we spend so much time on an arithmetic? Um, why is it important? Well, you look at a microprocessor chip, and let me just show you. I might have this just show you data path, but I don't have a picture of that thing sitting here. But you think about a microprocessor. You look at the whole chip, and what you see is a lot of cache memory, huge amount of caches. Then there's some messy stuff hanging out there. That's typically our controller. The thing that does the instruction fetching and all this type of stuff, things that does prediction, all this kind of thing that people have come up with to make something faster. And then there's one little structured entity that's kind of sitting there in the middle. It's called the data path. And that's really the workhorse. All the cache is there, all those cache memories, all those register files, they're only sitting there to make sure that your data path is always busy. What you want to make sure is that thing basically keeps crunching at numbers continuously. Okay? So if you look at the performance of a processor, it's very often dominated by how fast you can make that particular data path. The thing that does additions, does logical operations, does multiplications, and so on and so forth. So here's like a, an example of a um, Intel microprocessor, what the data path looks like. So it has a bunch of register files up front. There's a register here. It has six of those units. Actually, there's six of those data paths sitting in parallel. So your data output data, or your data that you're basically manipulating, is stored in the register file. And from every register file, we can send it to any other register file. So that's why we have those multiplexes up front here. Which are multiplexes that allow you to choose where the data is going to come from. So should I come from this thing, or should I come from memory, or where is the source of the data? And then it goes into this thing here which really is the ALU. So you have the logical unit plus some generation and carry generation of the adders, and then the combination of the two together. This is where the beef is. If I can make this thing two times faster, boy, my process is going to run better. And I can do a lot more work. So people spend a lot of effort on optimizing this thing. If there's any place in a processor where people will do careful transistor sizing and where they might do hand custom layout, it's going to be here, because that's really going to drive how good your process is going to be. So having said that, um, one more thing that you should observe is we have talked a lot about standard cells as a layout strategy. Uh, remember, same height of the cells, and then you put them in rows. In data paths, as I mentioned, I think, a couple of lectures ago, there the story is a little bit different, because think about it, you have a 64-bit data path you're really doing 64 times the same. Every bit performs the same functions right, in every word. So it often makes sense to organize your data path in a somewhat different way. What you see now is that what we optimize here is that I take my different functions. Let's say I take an add and a shift and a multiply and a register and things like that. What I would like to do is make sure that the, the wiring between those things is as short as possible. So that I can connect from this bit to this bit and then to the next bit without having to make a lot of zigzagging and so on and so forth. So in this case, what you see is what I've carefully done. Instead of making the height of the cell the same, I actually make the width of the cell the same. So that here's cell 1, here's cell 2, here's cell 3, here's cell 4. They're all exactly the same width. And I can stack them to each other and they perfectly align. And the next one aligns as well. And the next one aligns as well. So that's kind of a subtle difference. It's not subtle. It's kind of uh, fairly obvious. In standard cells, we equalize the height. In data path design, we equalize the width of the cells to make something which is nice and structured. So here's an example again. This is uh, your typical data path. You have uh, different adders. You, have, you stack them very carefully with each other. We route some buses over it so that I can basically track on it. And then you have some careful wiring occasionally between the different, between the different bit slices to make the connectivity. 
It's kind of shown right here. This is the uh, data part of the Itanium Intel processor. And as you can see here, you see all those different ALU units sitting very nicely stacked on top of each other. Okay? And they all have the same, if you look at it, it's exactly the same height, so that I can do my wiring on top of that and so on and so forth. So a lot more structure in here than, let's say, in here, which is your data path control and your bypass control. Those things tend to be standard cell-based implementations. Well, this is more bit sliced, very structured, regular type of layout patterns. Okay. Now, something you should also be aware of is that the data pod, since it does most of the work, is also from a thermal perspective going to be one of the big challenges. From a power perspective, going to be one of the challenges. So suppose I take a chip. Again, I take the titanium. Eighty percent of your chip is cache memory. Uh, level two, level three cache. That cache doesn't do very much. Right? Um, you occasionally pick something here and take a block from there, but overall the activity in the cache is going to be fairly small. I'm not reading all those words out of every clock cycle. Now, every clock cycle, I take some piece of the cache here, some piece of the cache there, and that's it. So the activity of cache is a lot lower than the activity, let's say, of the data path, which I basically clock every cycle. I basically try to jam data through it. Huge amount of activity. Activity means power. Power means heat. And it's quite obvious you take a chip and I run it, and then I do some tricks to expose the temperature of the chip, which we can do. There's a couple of tricks. For instance, I could put liquid, liquid crystal on top of the die, and you can look at it, and it shows very nicely color patterns of what is hot and what is not hot. Or there's, other, there's a variety of things that companies use to measure temperature gradients, or they simulate it very often as well. But you can see this is a typical, this is a process thermal map again from Intel. And it shows, here's my data path. And here's the cache. The cache is nice, deep blue. Blue means definitely peaceful, not much happening. Uh, so means cold. Well, if you look at your the execution core, red hot. That's where all the temperature and uh, where all the heat gets dissipated. And that's a challenge, right? Because remember, higher temperature means what? Slower operation. If I basically increase the temperature of a certain perform of a certain block, you see that my delay is going to go up, which is exactly what you don't want. You want to have small delays here. So managing the the heat dissipation in the data pod is very important because it is the most uh, power hungry uh, uh, part. So or reducing the energy in the data pod is an interesting goal. Okay, having said all that. If you now look at all the data path components, I have registers, I might have shifters, I have ALUs, logical units, and things like that. Turns out that one element comes back all the time. One of the most performance critical elements in any design is going to be the adder. Why the adder? Because the adder has one painful entity, is that its delay of an adder is not a constant value, but it's really going to be a function of the number of bits that I'm using. So a 32-bit adder is going to be slower than a 16-bit adder or an 8-bit. So that's a very painful component. And additions you have to do many, many, many times. And we always like to go to longer word lengths. So actually trying to optimize the delay of an adder is going to be very important. It's one of the crucial elements in the design. Because if I understand adders and how to optimize them, I think I can do multipliers. They're just a derivative. I can do a whole bunch of other stuff. I can do, I can do things like computations of sinuses or uh, arc tangences and things like that. At the core of those things will always be somewhere an adder or subtractor, which are the same, by the way. Uh, so n if you know how to do an adder, you're a long way on making fast arithmetic happening. But uh, it's not an easy problem. I think over the last 50 years, there's probably a million papers that have been written about different adder designs. Well, a million is a good number. But there's tons of papers that have been written on making adders faster, better designs, better implementation, newer logic families, uh, different structures, uh, proving what the fastest possible adder is you could make. So there's a whole conference which is called the Computer Arithmetic Conference, where not, half of the papers used to be adder papers. Uh, always people come up with new ideas. I think that's gotten down a little bit. I think we've figured everything out. Uh, by now. I hope so. But anyhow, 
So let's talk about addition. Um, goal is of an addition is to do the following thing, right? I have two input words, let's say A and B, and I want to get them added together. Now, at the core of this thing, so you say, here it is, plus A, B, and C as the output, and those are all not single bits, but have a certain word length. 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, you name it. So the way we're going to, the core of this thing, however, if you look at this adder, you'll see that's a repetition of the same element. Okay? And the repetition of the same element, that uh, we, what we call the full adder which add something that adds two bits together. So if you have 16 bits, you compose it out of things that add bits together individually. And the full adder does exactly that. It takes two bits and creates an output, which you call the sum. However, there's a catch. If I do addition, like I do by hand, so like I, 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 I add, uh, let's say, 18 and 19, the way I do it by hand is, well, 8 and 9 is 17. Oh. I have an extra overflow. This is one extra here. I'm going to pass it on to the next bit. And I say, okay, one plus one plus one is three. So I move something. There's some dependency between the different decimals or the different bits. I cannot do this all in parallel because before I know this result, I know I have to know what's going to come from the previous bit position. Okay? This is what we're calling the carry, the carry in. This is what I get from bit n minus 1, or i minus 1. And actually, if you do addition, you can see there's some time in 1 I have to pass to the next stage. That's the carry out. Okay? So actually, an adder, or a full adder, is a logical gate that has three inputs, a, b, and c, i, and two outputs, s and c out. So it's a three-input, two-output logic function. Now, once I know that, I, I can actually find the true table of a full adder. That's the first job you do, so I have a certain function to implement. So what's the true table? Well, I can enumerate this thing here. Okay, I'm going to get a sum, which is equal to 1, if I have either, uh, let me do, either 1 bit which is equal to 1 or 3 bits uh, equal to 1. Right? If I basically have an A, B, C, I, if I have 1 bit, equal to 1, this here, or 3 bits, you see that my sum is going to be equal to 1. In all the other cases, it's going to be 0. Like I add, um, it's obvious, right? 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 1 plus a carry. Or 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 is equal to 1 without a carry. So sum, 1 or 3 of the input bits are 1, your sum is going to be 1. For a carry, you need either two of the bits to be equal to one or three of the bits equal to one, right? Two bits, one, I'm going to get a carry out. One plus one, you get a carry. Three bits, you get a carry two, okay? So that's kind of how you have to remember the functionality. Sum, one or three, carry, two or three, okay? Now, the key challenge of designing a good adder is the fact that we have this C in, C out. If you think about it already, I want to add 16 bits together. Right? I apply those inputs. What's going to happen with the first gate is gone, might or might not produce a carry. That would go to the second gate. The second gate might or might not produce a carry. So your critical path, as you can already see, is going to run from the input carry to the output carry from full adder to full adder to full adder to full adder. So trying to minimize that carry in, carry out delay is going to be very important. The sum doesn't matter that much as we'll see later. It's really that carry in, carry out we have to work on. Okay? Now, it would be nice if I, if I know exactly, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter what the carry in is. I know I can predict the output already. Right? For instance, if both inputs A and B are zero, the output carry is guaranteed going to be zero. Right? There's basically there's never a chance it's going to have two inputs equal to one. So in that case, I say, okay, I don't have to wait. I know two inputs zero, the output is going to be zero. I know my carrier is going to be zero. We call this a delete or a kill. We say we kill off the propagation of carries from one to the other one. I like the delete. Kill seems a little bit violent to me. Um, 
The opposite case is true as well. If I have three inputs equal to one, you know for sure that your output is going to be a carry. Or if I have two inputs already one, you know that you're going to have a carry. Two or three. So that's a generate condition. We say we guarantee that the carry out is going to be one, independent of what's coming in from the previous bits. So we have the generate and we have the kill. What's happening in between, we don't know. Actually, is there's a number of other conditions when A, B, there's only one of A or B equal to one, one and only, then I don't know what the outcome is. It's really going to depend upon the input carry. If the input carry is zero, the output carry is going to be zero. If the input carry is one, the output carry is going to be one. We call this propagate. We just take the input carry and we move it to the next stage. Okay? So the nice thing about A and B is that they're known all simultaneously. I take two 16-bit words. A and B are all known simultaneously. So these conditions of propagate, delete, or generate are only a function of A and B. I can compute those instantaneously. Uh, I compute them, and then I have to wait for the carry to arrive, or sometimes I can predict what's going to happen with the gill of the delete positions. That's why this is kind of interesting. It's a reformulation of the equations will help us to make life easier. OK. So this kind of summarizes it. If you look at a binary adder, the carry out is from the time I have two bits one, I'm going to have a carry out. Right? A, B, B, C, I, A, C, I, carry out. The sum is the XOR. Remember, one or three is the XOR of A and B and C, I. Now you understand why I've mentioned before that, if that XORs are important. XORs is a function that is going to be a crucial element of every adder design. I want to be, have a fast adder? I better know how to do an XOR well. And that's because of this equation here. Because you can see if you write it in full, this is messy. It's a messy equation. And we're going to have to find ways to make this faster. OK, that's where I'm going to quit. Now what we're going to do next class is take these equations and I'm going to start manipulating them. Manipulating in such a way that I can make faster and faster adder structures. Okay. Already, I haven't said that. Uh, we'll pass out the. I'm going to just call your names alphabetically, and pass them out. So we. Um, that's the easiest way of getting the whole thing done.